Loretta, it's, it's really wonderful to be back with you in, in the place we actually first met. I knew a little bit about you because I had read your profile, that you had a background in geology, and that you were teaching at Mount Holyoke. And that's when I first learned that you had already learned and read about Aldo Leopold. So maybe that's a good place to begin. It's funny, I've never really tried to pin my learning. I, I, I would say it's more questioning to calling it ethics or putting it in any category. Um, it's really struggling to find my place in this world, to, to determine what it really means to be a citizen of this country, um, to be uh, a woman who realizes what her path in life is, but also to be a citizen of something larger than just a, a political nation, something that's more organic, more holistic, more, I, I guess, truly integrated. I, as a child, always had uh, a deep love or affection for the outdoors and And a lot of that was born uh, out of perhaps hiding or trying to escape from uh, experiences of prejudice, experiences that truly denigrated that, I mean, put me down is a, a very gentle way of saying it, but really had me wonder if I had any worth or value as a human being. And this is a child thinking these things. And so entering ninth grade, reading that book and reading this man who not only was so deeply tied to place in the sense of knowing its rhythms, its dailiness, its seasonal rhythms, but also understanding through that some of the core questions that one must address to really find one's place in the world. And I was just blown away. I was blown away. I was taken by that. And at the same time, I was frightened. I was really frightened. Because in reading, in particular, the land ethic, that begins with the, uh, with Odysseus killing the slave women who had, um, I guess, slept with Penelope's suitors and misbehaved. And that at that time, uh, because they were considered property, that they were not within the ethical circle of relevancy. And I thought that in a book that was so concerned about human relations to land, human relations to each other in this country, why wasn't there anything about slavery here? And the we and the us, I really, really worried that that didn't include me. It didn't include people who looked like me. It didn't include people who had origins outside of Europe. Um, and I did want, as children becoming adolescents often want, to, I guess if want can be that, that need, I need to know, otherwise I'm not going to know what the next step should be. And that want was to talk with Aldo Leopold, but I couldn't, I couldn't. And so the questions were there and they, they've remained unanswered or they remained unanswered for a long time. Well, you've been unable to separate your interest in that foundation in the land from your own yeah. fascination and curiosity and deep need to know the human story of the land as well. Mm -hmm. And I know you've wrestled with this. I know it's not been easy. And we've had more than a few conversations over the years about this. And I know it's impossible to tell that story in a short time but maybe you can at least help us to understand a little bit of the pathway toward where you are now over the years we've known each other and as you have 
tried to articulate this path and this story of your own. I think if experiences of a five, six, seven-year-old can be life-defining, then they definitely were for me. Um, I was born here in California, and um, on a day like this, it, it's really so clear. Um, the clarity of the light, the lay of the land, the brownness of the land in, in summer um, as opposed to winter. I had a self theory, um, and as a five-year-old can really have a theory of how everything happens, how everything comes to be, and I believed it. And I believed that if you look at my skin, you would see the blue in the veins, you'd see the skin, and so sky flowed in my veins, and that sun and earth made my skin. And that's what I believed. And that, I heard the term colored from people, but I didn't know what colored meant. And that's what I thought colored was. That was my definition of colored. Blue sky, sun, earth. And it was after we moved east to Washington, D.C., just in time for the 1968 riots, that I learned a color, colored meant something else or at least meant something else to many other people. And so much of my world just seemed to explode, to fall apart, to just become unknowing, unknown, and unknowable. Nothing made sense. And I experienced at, at a very young age that, that I could be hated um, for the color of my skin not because of who I was, but just from what I looked at. And I did run from that. And I ran to nature because nature, that outdoors, that had been so embracing, wasn't anything that would judge me. It wasn't anything that would hate me. And that was the draw. That was the original draw. And through the years, I guess I've needed to justify that, that very deep, heartfelt sense by making it academic. Um, therefore, it would be um, acceptable to others. You've obviously uh, explored your own pathway to reconciling a lot of difficult realities. And you've also opened pathways for others. Uh, as I've been listening to you and seeing you again the last few days, and even just your comments now make me think differently about your own work, in particular about the book you did called The Colors of Nature. And now when I hear that title, I hear it very differently than I even would have a day ago. And Maybe you could say a few words about that project in particular. It was a breakthrough. It and was. still is. Thank so you. Tell us, Thank you describe for... that book and that project to us, if you can. A few years ago, I uh, attended a, a writing conference uh, called The Art of the Wild. Um, it was in the Sierra Nevada, in a beautiful place. And there were about maybe 20 wonderful wonderfully gifted writers there. Allison Deming was there, Gary Snyder, Terry Tempest Williams, and so on, um, the, the usual crowd. And about maybe a hundred participants, um, people who very much like this, this event, come to be with these people, to work with these people, to listen, to be in dialogue. But it was a week long. And when I, when I got there, I saw that out of those hundred participants, I was maybe one or two or three people of color. And there were participants there who came up to me and would ask really two questions and two very troubling questions. One was, well, why, why isn't there nature writing by black people? Or why don't minorities write about nature? Um, that was question one. And question two perhaps was even worse. Why don't people of color care about the natural world. And they're troubling questions because they're beginning with an assumption, with a premise that's false. Um, 
And Alison Deming, who is a, a gifted poet, gifted essayist, and I started talking about these questions. And she had um, spoken with the, uh, the director and the creator of Milkweed Editions, a woman named Emily Bookwald, who was very interested in the idea, in the project, and she said, just do it. Ask writers if they would want to contribute to writers of color, if they would want to contribute to a book where they write about what they think nature is, but then she said, well, maybe nature isn't what I think it is. And so Allison and I asked maybe a hundred writers, including uh, Toni Morrison, who turned us down, but we expected that, but many others, uh, to write about what nature, place, environment, fill in the blank, what a particular spot means in your life, whether that be home, whether that be a city, whether that be a toxic environment, whether that be a barrio, a reservation, uh, a ghetto. But what is your connection to place, however you define it? And the reception was wonderful. We've gathered under the mm -hmm. banner, literally, of the geography of hope. And of all the people who've been here the last few days, you, that, that phrase for you has layers of meaning, strata of meaning, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps uh, we can conclude our conversation here with some thoughts from you on the theme of hope and the geography of hope. I would say that it really is going back to the two words, respect and responsibility, and adding conscience. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking of the origin of the, the word, and perhaps this is going back to high school because I had too many years of Latin in high school. Uh, but conscience, conciencia, um, means a coming together of thought, a coming together of internal, not duty, but obligation a coming together of not just within a person, but of many people. And so I guess for me, a geography of hope is truly that conscience, and maybe it is the ecological conscience, in the largest sense, where ecology, or if you say biodiversity, includes culture, includes human possibility in all, all shades, all different colors, all different notes, but a coming together in a way that is more of a, a weaving and integrating rather than conflict. And the geography of hope is, if it is a place in part, if it's a spirit, if it's a desire, if it's a wish, it's for all of that to be where these elements are threading, touching, feeling what is shared in common to a point of com common understanding. My geography of hope is this. Whether or not we can achieve it, I hope so, but I'm not sure. And that's what I fear.